This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African Drums are sounding. Good evening. Welcome to this week's edition of African Drums, the television organ of the Kofi 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. I'm Elsie Harry and I will be your host for this evening's program. The year 2014 has been a tumultuous one for Guyana at all levels of the society. From the budget wrangling to the prorogation of Parliament, the political rancor of previous years rose to, an un to unprecedented heights. As we welcome 2015, Guyanese are more uncertain than ever about a stable future for our beloved country. The doom varies, but it is the same agony etched on the faces and heard in the voices of those who, most, who must daily wonder when relief will come their way. But in the midst of pain, there have been small but reassuring initiatives taken by ordinary people and their allies in their communities to rid themselves of the scourge that the politics of revenge, recrimination, and domination inevitably leaves in their wake. One such initiative has been the Coffee 250 organization which hosts this program. Born two years ago of a concern about the rapid deterioration in the overall condition of African Guyanese and the consequences of this state of affairs for both the group and the country, this group has inserted itself in the quest for a better Guyana. In particular, a better deal for the beleaguered sons and daughters of Africa and the formerly enslaved. On today's program, we want to reintroduce Coffee 250 to you by discussing its origins and mission and the invaluable work it has done these past two years and its plans for the next year. With me to do that are two of its members. Dr. Marguerite jo Garvey is the chair of Coffee's Education Committee and Dr. David Hines is one of the organization's active members. Welcome to African Drums. Thank you. Thank you very much and glad to have me. Believe it or not, this is the first time I'm appearing as a guest on this show. <laughs> and not a, not a host. <laughs> yeah, I hosted a couple of times when you, when you abandoned us for, <laughs> for, 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 for greener pastures. Yes, but the first time, I'm, I'm glad to. Glad to have you. Yeah. <laughs> and glad to have you too, Marguerite. Thank you. Thank you for your welcome. Okay, so Dr. Garvey, let me start with you. You joined Coffee 250 this year. Tell the audience what inspired you to join the organization. Well, I, I returned to Guyana earlier this year, and of course, um, after having been abroad in the United States for 36 years, so I, I, you know, I'm faced with the task of, of finding my niche again in the Guyanese society. Um, I, you know, knew that I wanted to volunteer, uh, but then I thought that. I would like my um, the organization that I choose to fit into what I could bring to it, my experiences and my qualifications and, and everything like that. So I am, of course, I started looking around and talking to people and trying to find out what's exactly going on is in in Guyana. I <coughs> attended, I think, uh, the well not I think I attended the. Symposium, the August Symposium of Coffee 250, at um, held, which was held at the Critchlow Labor College, and I kind of immediately knew that that was where I wanted to fit myself into. I um, <coughs> I, I am qualified in the area of African and African American studies. Um, and I also, before I left Guyana, I had completed a master's in, uh, in Guyanese history, and of course, with the dominant theme of, of African 
Guyanese history. And I also have taught, um, all my experience in the United States was in the African American community. So I knew I could bring that background in terms of African studies to the organization. I liked, um, immediately when I uh, uh, attended that symposium, two things struck me in terms of my ability to be able to being able to fit into the organization. One was, of course, um, their unashamed emphasis on the African community. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of questioning of, you know, why do people want to isolate Africans? It happens in the United States, too. But we must. We, we recognize that um, our education, our experience has been different. We, yes, we are part of the Guyanese community in, in America, African Americans are part of the American community, but we have had this history, this terrible, uh, our history has been characterized by this um, oppression and degradation, or recent history, when I say recent, I mean um, for the past four or five hundred years, and so we recognize that special attention has to be paid to um, people of African descent in terms of their rehabilitation and upliftment in, in, in various communities in the diaspora. And the second area was the, the emphasis on history that Coffee 250 puts. Um, history I, I see as the instrument for um, the kind of education and the kind of knowledge and the kind of awakening that we need to pursue among African descended people. And, and, ag and again, this isolation of ourselves in terms of what we need to do to rehabilitate ourselves. Even the United Nations has recognized um, the need for this because they're beginning in 2016 emphasis. I think they're, they're establishing a decade of attention to African descended people. And um, of course, they recognize that we need the, the special emphasis need needs to be placed on us as as a people. And so, um, a number of forces came together to draw me into the organization. And um, uh, one more thing, uh, when I f a few weeks after I arrived, I visited one of my old, 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 um, he was my teacher, family friend, uh, 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 Professor Sammy Small. And he introduced me to the program, urged me to watch it, and to see how maybe I could make a contribution to Coffee 250. So I'm very grateful, I'm profoundly grateful to Coffee 250 for accepting me into this organization and for recognizing that I can make a contribution. Yeah, and mm. Coffee 250 is grateful to have <laughs> you for your experience and your willingness to be a part. So thank you. What mm. about you, Dr. Hines? I know you had a long and varied involvement in public life in Guyana, political activism, public scholarship, but what drew you to Coffee 250 Committee in particular? Um, you know, primarily the same two reasons that Marguerite um, mentioned. As you, as you said, I've been around public life in Guyana um, for the last 30 odd years, um, starting in the 1970s. And um, mainly, like you said, as a political activist doing political work and so forth. Um, but, 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 but when I was invited to become part of the early um, beginnings of the Coffee 250, um, I jumped at it immediately because I felt that there was a particular kind of work that needed to be done. And it was the kind of work that needed to concentrate on uh, black people and African Guyanese. Um, uh, as Margaret said, we live in a multi-ethnic society and there's always the temptation to talk about whether you're Guyanese first and something else second and so forth. I've never been um, bedeviled with that kind of <laughs> jumbie, right? Um, my Guyanese-ness is wrapped up in my Africanness, and my Africanness is wrapped up in my Guyanese-ness and my West Indianness and my blackness and so forth. And I've never seen the compartments. But I do recognize that different organizations 
play different roles in the society. Unfortunately in Guyana, over the last, I would say, 30 odd years or so, um, we have depended on the political parties to do a certain kind of um, empowerment work in the African Guyanese communities. And I think that um, uh, we've made a mistake there. Prior to the 1970s, we had Ask Korea between uh, the 1960s and 1970s. Before Ask Korea, we had a League of Colored People. So we have had a long history of organizations concentrating on the empowerment of African Guyanese. And um, we had stopped until ACDA came in the 1990s. For about 20 or 30 years, we had not had the kind of organization and the kind of emphasis um, uh, be, being paid. And so therefore, I, I felt that, um, yeah, I was doing political work, I was doing national work, and so on. But there's also a kind of work that I needed to be part of, and that is the empowerment of African Guyanese. I may be, quote unquote, a national political activist, but I'm, a, I'm an African Guyanese, and I owe something to the African yeah. Guyanese community. And so when I was invited to come to do that kind of work, I said, yeah. I mean, um, empowerment work, the work on um, uh, African Guyanese history, History, on black history is something um, that, 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 that drew me because I felt that um, there, was, there was a real need for that kind of work. Um, I suppose later on in the program we'll talk about how we got where we are, yes. but the slippage in the African Guyanese community is something that had been concerning me for the last decade or so, um, and, 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 and especially the cultural slippage. And I think part of the cultural slip has to do with our re-disconnection, our disconnection from our heritage and from our history. And so like Marguerite, I felt that uh, Coffee 250, which positioned itself to really do that kind of work, I felt that I could not stay outside of that tent. I needed to be part of that tent. Okay, so mm -hmm. now that we know why both of you joined Coffee 250, Dr. Hines, let me ask you this. What inspired the birth of the Coffee 250 Committee? Well, there are two things. There are two things that drove us um, two years ago, um, nearly two years ago when we um, decided to do this. The first thing was um, a recognition, as I began to said, just say just now, of a kind of slippage in the African Guyanese community. Now, slippages in communities among uh, peoples are normal. It's a normal part of, 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 of history. Uh, um, uh, 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 groups uh, rise and then there are setbacks and they have to get up and start again and so forth. Uh, in the African Guyanese community, some of us who had begun to talk about this felt that uh, we had begun to lo lose our way a long time ago, but it had become uh, emphasized over the last 20 years uh, or so. And I say the last 20 years because over the last 20 years, uh, the political directorate in the country has been a quote-unquote Indian Guyanese political directorate. And in countries like Guyana and the rest of the Caribbean, we often link the fate of groups to the political parties. And so when the political party that is associated with a particular group is no longer in office, that group tends to fall back um, because of the way in which, we, in which we've developed. And so we felt over the last 20 years, we had seen a systematic um, falling back, a systematic losing of the way on the part of African Guyanese. And we felt that it was going along for too long and that it needed a drastic intervention on the part of African Guyanese leaders and African Guyanese groups. And so that was the first thing we wanted to highlight what we felt was the falling back of the African Guyanese community. And I will explain later on, I'm sure you would um, ask me to do that, uh, what that falling back is. But that, that, that was one of the things that drove us. We wanted to restore the African Guyanese community to a, a particular position where it can function as a co-equal with other ethnic groups in the society. Now, when you live in a multi-ethnic society like that, and if one ethnic group perceives itself or is or is perceived by others to be at a place where the other ethnic groups are, then you're talking about the dysfunctional society. For a multi-ethnic society to be functional, uh, the emphasis on equality 
ethnic equality, racial equality has to be paramount because these African Guyanese perceive themselves not to be the equal of their East Indian counterparts and vice versa. Then you are talking about the very basis upon which the society, this one people, one nation, one destiny, um, uh, uh, the very basis of it is about ethnic e e e equality. And so therefore, um, we felt that we needed to restore African Guyanese or to encourage the restoration of African Guyanese to a place where they can be on an equal footing with other groups. So that was the first thing that drove us. And the second thing that drove us was the 1763 um, rebellion. We call it the Barbie Slave Rebellion, the Coffee Slave Rebellion. You know, a momentous global event. Because uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we've talked about all the time, uh, and Margaret touched on it, is the experience of enslavement on the part of uh, black people uh, all over the world. Uh, in the diaspora, which has been unique. It is what makes us different. Uh, um, and difference is a good thing. Some people tell, oh, why, why we have to emphasize difference? Difference is a very good thing, all right? Uh, it, doesn't mean, what, it doesn't mean that because you're different, you are better. But it's different, and we have to be different. The experience of enslavement on the part of African guys is a singular, singular experience. No other group in the history of humanity has had to undergo, uh, has undergone that kind of experience. And so, therefore, what we today call the African Guyanese or the Afro Caribbean or the African American, the Afro Brazilian, that 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 culture, uh, that group, uh, was created in the bowels of slavery. And so if you're creating a people, you're creating a culture in the bowels of slavery, because remember, what slavery did was to cut black people off from Africa. And so they had to, they had to create a new thing for themselves here. And so that thing obviously has to be different. Now, the, 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 the aspirations and the character of the slave cannot be the aspirations and the character of the slave master. And so therefore that makes us fundamentally as a people very, very different. And so so part of what, part of that difference has to do with the fact that over the last five years, we have constantly had to fight and fight back. And part of what 1763 is about, is about that. It's about a group of enslaved people say, we're not taking this anymore. We're no longer going to be enslaved. And they struck a blow for their own freedom. And they won that freedom and held on to that freedom for a period of time until the, 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 the might of the slave masters were able to, to subdue them. But only for a time, because they rose again in 1823, and they rose again in 1838, and they continued to rise again and to fight back. And so we felt that one could not begin to talk about the African Guyanese experience outside of the coffee slave rebellion, because I think it really um, reflects who we are as a people, a people who ought to really say we, we are not going to stay in a kind of depraved situation. We are not going to accept degradation. We are going to fight back. And in the process of fighting back, we are going to create something that is unique that we can contribute to human civilization. And so we felt that we needed to bring 1763 to the present and to show there is a linkage between 1763 and the present. And that linkage, we wanted to be the thing that would guide us in Coffee 250 as we go forward. We took the name, 250th anniversary of the 1763 rebellion in 2013, when we were formed. And we, we wanted to use that symbol of the 1763 rebellion as a, as a reminder that we are here, as a reminder that we are here because we struggled. And and as a reminder to African Guyanese people that we come from a history of struggle, a history of fighting back, and not a history of sitting down and taking blows and turning the other cheek as we have become some or the other custom to do. And, 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 and so we wanted to do. So those two things, the 250th anniversary of the Coffee Rebellion, reigniting the coffee spirit in the present, and then the second thing, to arrest the decline, what we saw as a decline at, on all fronts in the African Guyanese community, and restoring that community to a position of equality with others. Those are the two things that drove us to begin Coffee 250. Okay, you spoke about restoration in the African Guyanese communities. What are the main objectives of Coffee 250? How does it go about doing this? restoration because we know a lot of times you have organizations and their objectives get caught up 
in what the elite members want to see and then they don't impact the masses in the way we'd like them to. So tell us about the big objectives of Coffee 250 and how it goes about doing this restoration work. I'll start and then Margaret will join in and I'm only starting because um, I was there at the beginning and, and, and wanted to set the stage and M Margaret will, um, will, will, will pick up. Uh, look, the big objective of Coffee 250 is really as, as I've begun to say, to reinstill a sense of dignity and pride in the African Guyanese community. We, felt, we feel that no ethnic group in any part of the world can survive it do, if it does not have a, a pride in who it is. Okay? And because of our own experience, our own historical experiences, we have always um, had to reinforce that, that whole sense of self-affirmation. I'm black and proud and I'm beautiful is something that black people have to constantly say because they are, they have been a systematic effort to uh, take that away because that's what enslavement meant, taking away your dignity, your pride, your humanity. You are not a human, you're a chattel and so forth. And so the construction, the reconstruction of dignity and pride is a constant thing. And so part of what Coffee 250 wants to do is to make sure that black people in Guyana can stand up erect and to look other ethnic groups in the face and say, we are your equals. We are your sisters and brothers, but we are your equal sisters and brothers. And we have made an equal contribution to this country and we deserve an equal place in this country but we are not going to sit back and say no give us that equal place we are going to lift ourselves we're going to lift ourselves economically politically culturally and, and and stand from so part of what the big thing that coffee wants to do is to bring back that spirit that used to be here 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when you were black and you were African, you could stand in Guyana, you could say, I am black, I'm beautiful, I'm proud. I am somebody, as the Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson would say to African Americans. Now, some people may say, well, wh why there's need to do that? Well, there's always need to do that because somebody's always trying to make us less than we are. Look in America, what's happening? Ferguson, Staten Island, that is part of what? The, 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 the assault, the violence, the constant violence on African Guyanese. And um, so we, we, we want to say that in spite of that constant violence, uh, we, 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 we are going to stand up. And the way that you are going to beat back that is that you are going to be who you are. Now, you're not racist. You're not trying to say I'm better than somebody. All you're trying to say, I am somebody too. And so we wanted to bring back that spirit where someone will wear the dashiki and not be ashamed of it. Where someone will be able to say, look, I'm going to look at African drums because I want to learn something about my own history. Where someone will say, I am going to join Coffee 250 because I want to help black brothers and sisters to lift themselves and to be part and equal part part of, 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 of this country. So that's the, the, the big thing that, 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 that we want to do, bring back uh, that pride. The second big thing that we want to do is that we want not just black people to say, I am black and I am proud, but we want to help in restoring an ethic in the black community that is intrinsic to us. And that ethic is the ethic of self-reliance. Hmm? and self-organization we're in our small communities and in our large communities that we can get together as sisters and brothers and to begin to look after our own business because we felt that a bad habit had slipped into the black community and I would argue more than slipping into the black community a bad habit was, um, was, was beaten into the black community and that is the habit to depend on somebody to depend on the government to come in, the, the, to come in and do your thing for you or to depend on some handout or to depend on funding and part of what we in Coffee 215 say look around your community look at what you have there look at the state of your community look and see what you can do if you look around your community you see little children running around and not going to school. There's something you can do about that. There are children who are going to school but they're not performing to the optimum because uh, for various reasons. No, there's something you can do in that. So what we want to do, the second big thing, is to bring about that community spirit. And that community spirit is intrinsic 
to us. I'm not saying it's not intrinsic to others, but when you talk about the village movement in this country, when you talk about where we are today, you are from Victoria. Uh, Marguerite, I'm sure you're from, originally from where? Vreden Hoop. Vreden Hoop. Right, right, right. We all come from villages. We move to town. And part of what the village meant is that we are a community and an wash and make and come clean. That was what villages were about. Our foreparents took that initiative just as they came out of slavery. 300 years. And they say, the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to think about ourselves and developing ourselves, not as individuals, but as a community. And so we want to reignite that community spirit where people in their communities can begin to organize again in their own self-interest. No, we are never going to solve the problems in the black community by just organizing ourselves. Of course, there is a role for government. Of course, there is a role for NGOs and so forth. But we are saying that the the basis, the work, the early work that needs to be done is the work of people in their own villages coming together. So I would say those are the two big things. Okay, and Dr. Garvey, you are the chairperson of a subcommittee mm -hmm. in Coffee 250. It's the Education mm -hmm. Committee. So, of course, education must be a part of mm -hmm. one of the objectives. So tell us about that and about any other objectives that Dr. Hines may have okay. left out. So one of the things we did as an, an, an education committee, and that committee um, included an, a number of very um, smart, dynamic thinkers. One of the things we've done over the past three months is we created a number of curricular um, programs that we um, are offering or are, are we are expo you know, at least... Um, offering is a good word to the various communities that we go into not in terms of um, our imposing these ideas on them but they will be given opportunities to make choices in terms of what their needs are which of these areas that they find most appropriate in terms of what they want to see happening in their villages and some of those curriculum areas are um, like creative expression and um, sp uh, sports, areas in sports, areas in crafts and, and carpentry. I am particularly proud of one program that, that I created which is called Selfhood Education. It's a program directed primarily for children but we would encourage um, their parents to be part of the sessions that we hold. Um, when we talk about self education, we mean exactly what it says, focusing on the self, helping the children to understand who they are as human beings, as individuals, as Guyanese, and as part of the wo as, as African descended people, and as part of the larger world community. Um, I um, one of the uh, interesting little um, anecdote, I uh, started a program in, a, in a, um, this program in uh, 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 urban community in the city. And one of the things as we came towards Christmas, uh, I began to notice that all the images that they were putting out were focused on the Santa Claus images and the snow men and the icicles falling from the skies and that sort of thing. So I began to talk to the children about focusing on yourself and your own environment. And I, you know, asked a stupid question. I said, well, what do you see in your own environment when you look out the window? And one of the smart kids said, I see rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, but I, I was able to use that as a jumping off point. That's not natural to the environment. Um, what do you see that's natural? When the, the American kids look at snow, that's natural to their environment. So I challenged them to come back in January when we resume, because we, you know, we um, broke up for Christmas, for the Christmas holidays, to come back and um, bring me some cards, Christmas cards, New Year cards, that depict images of your own environment. We want to focus on, we want them to focus on their own consciousness, their own experiences, um, 
their own communities, of course. Um, there's a lot of history, the history that David was talking about, infused in that curriculum, so that they understand where they come from, their past, what their ancestors went through, so that they could begin to, to map out their courses for the future. So um, we're l I am looking forward to really being able to work with parents and children with that curriculum in various areas. One of the things I want to do really is to train people in the various areas, communities, to work with that program so that they're not always dependent on me or Coffee 250 people to come into their communities. They can learn to handle these, um, all the curriculum projects on their own. So Coffee 250 is not only designed to provide personnel to go in and help, but also to train people to work on their own, to develop that self-efficiency and self-initiative. So I'm excited about the Education Committee and where we plan to take our, our you know, program in the, as we approach 2015, during 2015. Okay, in addition to the selfhood education mm -hmm. program, what other things has Coffee 250 done over the past two years of its existence? And this is a question for both of you. Mm -hmm. um, we, one of the things that we're very proud of, um, and we spent a lot of time doing that this year, but let me, let, let me back up. One of the first things we did was to organize last year what we call the State of African Guyanese Forum. It's a big forum in Georgetown. We had over 400 people there. We repeated it this year, um, uh, and it has now become, um, if you will, a standard uh, fair in the African Guyanese community, where we meet uh, once per year in big numbers to really talk about our problems in a kind of setting the stage. And then what we've done in between those meetings is to then go into the communities. And uh, so for the last two years, we've been into almost 40 communities across across um, the country, um, uh, holding uh, bottom house meetings, talking to people, and our meetings are educational. I mean, we're not going there to talk, oh, vote for us and that kind of thing. That's uh, for political parties. When we go, is that we go into the communities and we talk to people about their own issues and their own problems, but we also infuse education in that, because as you are from Marguerite, education, public education, is, uh, is, is, is our, our stock in trade, if you will, in the sense that we feel that uh, at the basis of any kind of empowerment is knowledge. And so we want to provide that kind of knowledge. That is those of us who were so-called doctors and so forth, went away and study and your doctor this and doctor that. Well, the challenge is to come back and to share some of that with the communities. Because in the first place, we become doctors because of sacrifices that people in the communities made um, to send us to school. We had free schooling um, at North at the university and so forth and so that um, education becomes very important so we've been doing these forums we go around and we talk with people um, we, we, we take experts in to really um, have discussions with people and we've held these forums from Essequibo right up to West, West Bobis and we've had about 40 of them in the last two years now in terms of concrete programs we have developed something called um, uh, 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 freedom um, camps, uh, emancipation camps. Um, what we what we've held um, two of them thus far, uh, where we bring children together and we have them uh, uh, engage in an educational process outside of the classrooms, of course. Um, uh, African Guyanese history, black history, African history. We talk about health, we talk about education, we talk about, as Margaret said, about the whole question of the African selfhood, what um, one African um, scholar activist, Edward Blyden, um, talks about the African personality um, and, and, and what that is. That is what it is that is unique about us as a people. What is it that makes um, a, 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 a Walter Rodney born in Guyana but goes on to become uh, the foremost expert in African history? What is it that makes um, an Ivan Van Sortima, a Guyanese, go out into the world and write the seminal book, They Came Before Columbus, which really exposed a lie, which said that black people came here just to stay with, really set the state for us to 
examine and understand that black people were here in the New World, in the, in the Americas before slavery, which says very importantly, that we have a history um, uh, 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 um, other than uh, slavery and, and before slavery. What makes a Stokely Carmichael, born in Trinidad, but goes to the United States and becomes the leader of the black power movement in the United States? What makes a Marcus Garvey, born in Jamaica, goes to the United States and leads what is still today the largest and most important black Pan-African movement with chapters all over the world? We want those young people in these young children to understand that they are the, the fruits of those um, people, that, 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 that the Garveys and the Rodneys and, 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 and Carmichael and others, that they, represented, they represent something that is unique, that we in Guyana and the Caribbean have given to the world, right? A Bob Marley, Jamaican, but sings to the world and captures the imagination of the world and make them recognize that a little poor boy from Jamaica can become the spokesperson for social justice in song. And to say to these young people, but you come from that. You come from that. You come from good stock. So we want to use these emancipation camps to expose them to this notion that as a black people, we are freedom people. Right? We are, we are an emancipatory people. That when we won emancipation in 1834 and 1838, that we were not only emancipating African people, but we were also emancipating those who were to come after because they could not come as slaves because of African Guyanese. So we wanted, we want these young people to come to those emancipation camps to learn that they're part of something that is larger, to reconnect them with that history and that heritage. Um, and so, because part of the education problem, we think, in this country, it is not just that the children can't read and write and can't count and so on, but part of it is that they do not feel a sense, feel a part of something that is magnificent. They look outside and they see um, what the young, what the child tell you? I see rubbish. rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And if you look outside and you see rubbish every day, you think that that's part of your heritage, rubbish. And so we want to rubbish that, right? And to say that, but you're part of something that is more, much more magnificent than that, than, than, than that. And so we've been holding these emancipation camps. We had one very successful at Stanley Tong, um, uh, in um, on the west bank of Demerara. Um, wonderful. It set the stage. They were right here in the studio, really um, talking to Guyana about their experience. And then we had another one on the weekend in um, in Baxville. And, and 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 we intend to hold these um, uh, uh, much more, many more of these in the, in the in the in the coming year. But those, those those are two things. The forum. We've done the emancipation camps. We have this television program which you are instrumental in and part of what this deliberation program is to do exactly what we're doing here is to communicate and talk to our people out there and to give them hope and to give them some strength and lift them up because part of what we are experiencing in Guyana as we say is the falling down and so we want to lift our people up and so these those are a few concrete things that we're doing um, that we've done over the last um, two years and that we intend to expand on those um, as we move forward. Okay, mm -hmm. and David Hines, you are very, very dedicated to the work of Coffee 250. You're part of the USA chapter and the local chapter here. So tell us about the work of the USA chapter. Y yes, I'm very glad you asked that because um, one of the things that we've not talked about much is the, the U U.S. chapter. Yes. And we do have a U.S. chapter based mainly in uh, the Washington, D.C., Maryland area. Um, and we function like this. And part of what we do is to um, support the work here. But we have been doing our own um, outreach work and educational work in the United States. Um, l this year, in May, we had a big um, uh, seminar, uh, a big symposium or a conference on independence. What is the meaning of independence in Guyana? What it has meant? How, how we've got here and what independence means for the next 50 years? And we ignited a conversation. We were able to um, have uh, Brother Nigel Hughes, um, the Honorable David Granger, um, uh, uh, they uh, went up to the um, uh, Mr. Carl Greenidge and went up there and we had a wonderful conference 
difference in terms of reigniting a conversation among the diaspora about the meaning of independence and uh, going forward. So we're doing that in February. We're planning um, a big Black History Month. As you know, Black History Month uh, is February in the United States, and we're planning a similar um, uh, discussions uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the United States in, uh, in February, and we plan to repeat that conference, that independence conference um, next year. So we do the kind of outreach work in the African Guyanese community and beyond. We do a lot of radio um, programs. We go on to radio programs and we try to talk to people. Um, a few weeks ago, I was on, the, uh, on a radio program uh, in the Washington, D.C. area talking about Coffee 250's work. It was a program that uh, was discussing the viol police violence in the United States of America and the parallels in the Caribbean. And so I was on there with um, Brother Kafra Kambon from a black consciousness movement in Trinidad and Tobago. And so we do a lot of that kind of work there in um, the United States, linking the work that is being done here, sensitizing people about that over there, and then linking people over there with the kind of grassroots work that is being done here. Okay. For those viewers who are just joining us, this is African Drums, the television organ of the Coffee 250 Committee. I'm Elsie Harry, and we are discussing tonight the work of Coffee 250 2014 and beyond. And to help me do that are two members of the Coffee 250 Committee. Now I want to engage you on some topical issues in Guyana. About two weeks ago, the Coffee 250 Committee had a forum on the prorogation of Parliament. And I want to know from both of you, how does this impact African Guyanese directly or indirectly in Guyana? And what does, it, what does prorogation actually mean for the society? What is um, obviously, we, we decided that the forum was important in terms, it's, an ed it's part of our educational organ, um, you know, enlightening Guyanese about what's going on, the, the specific details related to the impact that prorogation is going to have on their, on their lives. And so we saw it as a, as a very Im important opportunity to expose the Guyanese public to, we, we have, of course, we invite professional people, experts in the field, to explore the issues because we recognize we, we can't do everything. We're not everything to everybody. So I thought the forum was very successful and um, in terms of the information that was explained to the Guyanese public. Mm -hmm. But I let the Politician, take <laughs> up on that. Politician, <laughs> that's a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, 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 yeah, I mean, the, the look. Uh, politics in Guyana, um, uh, you know, are ethnically grounded. African Guyanese uh, generally vote uh, for one party. Indian Guyanese vote for another party. And so when one, um, and, and we know that um, one party is in the executive branch, um, the PPP, which is a representative of East Indians uh, in the executive branch, and African Guyanese are generally represented by the party in, 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 in parliament. And so when the president prorogues parliament, what he's doing there is dismissing the representatives of African Guyanese. Right? So that at this moment, African Guyanese have no representation in the councils of government in this country. Um, Indian Guyanese generally could be said um, to... Um, the executive branch is still functioning. The president and his cabinet, they are still functioning. And uh, generally, they are representative of East Indians. So even in this mess, East Indians can still, at an academic level, say that we still have some representation, even though the parliament is prorogued and our parliamentary representatives are not there. At least uh, uh, they are representing the executive branch. African Guyanese cannot claim the same. So as I said, when we sit here now, African Guyanese have absolutely no representation in the halls of government. We are not representing the executive branch, and so and our representatives in the legislative branch have been dismissed. And so that is the direct relationship of prorogation to 
um, uh, the African Guyanese community. And we in Coffee 250 feel very strongly that any, any, any action by the government that interferes with representation of people regardless of their ethnic origins is very dangerous. And since we are grounded in the African Guyanese, we take especially, um, we especially are affronted by this act because we are saying that in a multi-ethnic society, when the government is making any move, it must take into consideration the multi-ethnic nature of the society. And you must ask yourself, when I'm taking this action, does it or will it offend the ethnic communities? Will it offend African Guyanese? Will it offend East Indians? Will it, uh, Indian Guyanese? Will it offend Amerindians? Will it offend the Portuguese? You have to ask those questions because you live in a society in which ethnicity plays an important role. And so therefore we feel that the, prog the proroguing of the parliament was really an assault on African Guyanese representation because it has stripped us for the last month or so of any formal representation in the government of this country. Okay, and uh, as it relates to race relations, like you just mentioned, in an alleged conversation with the Attorney General and a journalist, he raised the issue of caste superiority. And then a few weeks later, the Minister of Home Affairs publicly called Shaquille Grant, a young man shot in Agricola by a police officer under questionable circumstances, a criminal. The ruling party later apologized to the mother, but obviously these things have to do with race relations. What is Coffee 250's opinion on these two incidents? Well, in keeping with our own notion of equality and justice for all people, now we're we grounded in the African Guyanese community, but we can't talk about justice for African Guyanese outside of justice for all Guyanese. All right? Um, and so we have to be very concerned, and we are very concerned, when these old racist um, slippages, you, you know, they, they find themselves into the political mix. Now, both ministers represent the government. And I think what is happening is a kind of frightening development. Professor Clive Thomas talks about the criminalization of the state. Uh, uh, columnist Freddie Kisun talks about a kind of ideological racism. And I think when we look at those two statements, the, the, the Attorney General boasting about his high caste, in, 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 in a multi-ethnic society in which ethnicity and racism are sensitive things, for you to be boasting about how high class and how high class you are is really uh, speaking volumes about the racial orientation of the state itself. Because the Attorney General is a high state official. And my position is that your, your private views on matters of race cannot be divorced from your public views of matters of race. And so when the Home Affairs Minister refers to the young man who was shot and killed by the police as a criminal, it um, exposes a mindset that says that the young African Guyanese, just like the young black person all over the world, is seen first and foremost a criminal. And then you have to prove yourself that you are not a criminal. So it is very easy for the Minister of Home Affairs, who is responsible for, um, for the security of this country, and the Attorney General who is responsible for justice system in the country is ironic. But it's true that these two government ministers, within the space of a couple of weeks, are exposing a kind of uh, racial uh, domination, a kind of racial superiority. Um, uh, and so therefore, we in Coffee 250 are very, very concerned about that. And we urge Guyanese people, all Guyanese people, to really stand up and to say that we cannot afford in this 21st century for Guyanese of any ethnic group to be uh, 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 symbolically referred to in such, in, in, in such ways as criminals. And when this young man was shot innocently, he was an innocent young man, was shot by the police, the policemen are charged, but you are what? You, the Home Affairs Minister, you are prejudic prejudicing whatever outcome could come by saying that this man is a criminal, the young boy is a criminal. And I think that is part of a particular kind of mindset that has found itself in the state of this country, and we are concerned about that. Okay, and it seems like the Guyanese communities and the African Guyanese communities in particular have had to deal with a set of 
incidences this year in particular. Recently, in Plaisance, the villagers have been caught in a fierce battle with the government over ancestral lands. So, Dr. Garfi, I want to hear from you. What is Coffee 250's view on ancestral lands? Uh, actually, I think we've uh, actually had um, representatives from the from Pleasants who've actually been on this program yes. and who have talked about about the yes. problem. Um, the obviously ancestral lands are ancestral lands and belong to the people. Yes. The the problem is as we move forward, what approaches need to be taken to break down the kind of blatant theft of these lands that is going on throughout the country so that um, Coffee 250 is, as a matter of fact, that this kind of brings me into some of the things that we are preparing in terms of the way forward. Coffee 250 is um, for um, the 2015 has designed an elaborate kind of um, set, sets of activities. One of the topics is legal entitlement. One of the first topics that we're going to look at in January is legal entitlement. Um, we're we're going to send this information out to the public. We're hoping that, for example, this, this program would be a way of um, enlightening the public, giving the public the kind of information that they need to prepare themselves to attend our workshops and seminars. We, we know that we have to become involved in helping to open up the discussions and the, the process of addressing these um, blatant miscarriages of justice that are going on. Mm -hmm. and, and there are other, if you, I don't, I'm not sure what's your next question, but uh, there are other areas on, our, on my spreadsheet. I brought my, my spreadsheet in case my memory fails in terms of giving this information out to the public in terms of how they can prepare themselves um, for the kinds of workshops and information that we're going to be disseminating in the year to come. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that at okay. uh, sure. sh the last sure. end of the sure. program. So shared governance and constitutional reform keep coming up in conversations as a political solution. What's Coffee 250's views on these issues from an African Guyanese perspective? How important are these things? Well, yes, um, constitutional reform has to be very important because remember we've been talking all night about equality and justice and ethnic equality has to be the bedrock on which our society moves forward. And when we look at the political systems that we've had since independence, those political systems have not fostered ethnic equality. We have a kind of what you call winner-take-all Politics, you go to an election and you win the government and you take all the government. Um, even when you don't win all the government, you take all the government. And um, because, you know, we vote along ethnic lines, yeah. it means that the ethnic group that wins, wins, and the ethnic group that loses, loses. And we feel that we need to reform our constitutional arrangements to make it much more equal. That is, at the end of the day when we go to an election, no ethnic group loses that all ethnic group wins. That is, all ethnic group can look at the government and to say this government looks partly like us. This government is looking after our interests also. Right now, what we have are governments that look after the interests of only the supporters, which is half of the population, half meaning one ethnic group, and so forth. And so we think that as in our pursuit of ethnic equality and ethnic justice, that constitutional reform and a shared joint governance in this country are essential to fostering equality. Okay. <coughs> a few Sundays ago... Coffee 250 had a program on reparations. Dr. Garfi, I'll start with you. Why is reparations important from a Coffee 250 standpoint? Oh, absolutely to redress the injustices that have been done to us throughout, uh, you know, our historical presence in, in the diaspora. Um, as, I, as I mentioned previously, I see that the United Nations is going to devote uh, a, a decade, a decade mm -hmm. towards these kinds of questions. 
um, it's important to us because as a, as, a, as a group of people, African descendants, we are behind, so to speak, in terms of our human, um, human development, our cultural development, and our ability to move forward. It's important to us, uh, y you know, to be engaged in this topic also because um, we, we recognize that European governments have risen on the backs of our ancestors and it, it's time for them to repay just to repay the, the, the debt that they owe to us. And so um, it's, it's a topic that definitely, again, we had, that's, it's on my spreadsheet, Coffee to Fifty recognizes as we move forward that we have to have open discussions on these kinds of issues. Okay, since we're almost out of time, let us end with some of the items on your yeah. spreadsheet, some yeah. of the things that Coffee has planned for the year. As I said, legal entitlement is one of the first coming up in, in January. We have youth workshops dealing with particular issues related to youth. We have cultural forums, issues related to health education, and food safety and security, very important because um, we're eating food that is grown um, with all kinds of chemicals and we don't realize some of the, d the destruction that's being done to our bodies. And in, in the context of being self-sufficient, we, we need to begin to understand how that we should be engaged in a producing our own food so that we can have control over what we, what we eat. We, recognizing that there is an impending election, we have, uh, we're going to have workshops on voter education, trying to educate the public in terms of what's ahead. We also um, recognize that we're talking about a lot about our Afri Africanness or Africanity, but it's we haven't explained ourselves in that context. And so we're going into topics such as African spirituality. What does it mean? And what, how much of it is retained among those of us who are descendants of Africa? We're also talking about, well, reparatory justice. So the reparations um, topic is on here. We're also talking about police brutality, which David just mentioned. In, in, uh, in terms of parallels between what's going on in the United States and what goes on here. Um, and of course there are always our historical topics, um, African history, Guyanese history, world history and where we fit in. So that we have an ambitious um, um, curriculum yes. and we're, we're encouraging all the communities to become engaged with us and so that we can help them promote their educational programs. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Garvey. And Dr. Hines, would you like a half a second because we are out of time? It's, it's very difficult <laughs> to give Dr. Hines half a second. Just a half uh, of a second. Uh, but just to say um, uh, that we have had a wonderful year and to wish all our viewers uh, a Merry Christmas and um, that we will have a very constructive and productive New Year. The challenge is still on. We are inviting people to come and join Coffee 250. Um, please um, join us. Uh, if you are in the communities and you want Coffee 250 to come into communities, please call us. But more than that, we need members to help us to discuss charge um, our duties and remember as you know I always say you know, I mean to be black and to say you are black and to say you are proud is not a crime to be black and to say I'm African Guyanese does not mean that you're not Guyanese in fact to say that you're African Guyanese is to really be saying that look I am quintessentially Guyanese because the African people crossed the Middle Passage and they came here and they made an equal contribution to our nation and made it possible for a multi-ethnic nation to be where it is today. Okay. You did good on the half. Of the <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Garvey and thank Dr. Hines for being on the show. You're welcome. And viewers, thank you for staying with us.
Please like our Facebook page, Coffee 250, and our YouTube channel, Coffee 250, for videos of the show. Please donate to the cause, and we'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email, coffee250gy at gmail.com. This has been African Drums, the television organ of the Coffee 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. I'm Elsie Harry. Please join us next week. This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African Drums.